there's that paradox that we so often have when we chant before the meditation. The contemplations of aging, illness, and death, inconstancy, stress, not self. Thinking about how the things that we tend to identify with as us or ours really aren't us or ours. And ultimately, lie beyond our control. And we live in a world that's swept away with no protection. Whatever we have will be we'll have to leave behind, and yet we're still a slave to craving. All of that on the one hand, and then on the other hand, the chant, may I be happy, it sounds so wistful in the face of all that other contemplation of what is, sounds pretty hopeless. But the Buddha didn't teach us to be hopeless. The Buddha pointed out the negative side of the world. It wasn't just to say, okay, give up hope, all ye who have been born here. It was to help us realize that the things that we've been contenting ourselves with for so long are not really worth it, but there is something better. And that something better can be found through our actions. That's another contemplation we have. I'm subject to aging, subject to illness, subject to death. Be separated from what is dear and appealing to me. Those are contemplations to give rise to a sense of sanguega. And then there's a contemplation for a basada, which is a sense of confidence. I'm the owner of my actions, heir to my actions. Whatever I do, for good or for evil, to that will I fall heir. So we do have the power of our actions. This was so important in the Buddhist teachings that even though he wasn't the sort of person who would go out and argue with people, pick fights with people, there were times when he would go and find people who were teaching that what you're doing right now didn't have an impact right now. Three different groups of people, those who taught that whatever you experience right now is a result of past actions. It's your vipaka, so you've got to put up with it. Those who taught that whatever you experience right now is the result of some creator God having created the world, you've got to put up with it. And those who taught that whatever you experience right now is totally random. There's no pattern of cause and effect that you can understand or master to make a change in things. As the Buddha said, all these people are basically teaching a doctrine of non-action, even the ones that once have taught about the power of your past actions. He said if everything you experience right now were dependent on your past actions, people would be killers right now because of past actions. They would steal right now, have illicit sex, lie, take intoxicants. In other words, they wouldn't be responsible for the choices they're making right now, the way they're shaping their experience right now. There'd be no path that you can follow. So he's making the point that you can make a difference right now. Now, given the, the power of past actions, sometimes you're stuck with certain things because of what you did in the past, but you don't have to suffer from those things. They don't have to invade the mind and remain. That's the phrase that the Buddha uses. It's like the difference between the third foundation of, or third establishing of mindfulness and the fourth. The third talks about different states of mind, those imbued with passion, those without passion, those with anger, those without anger, those that are restricted, those that are scattered. And then it starts going up the ladder of how your mind improves as it gets into concentration. But it basically talks about the state of the mind as mind, as a whole. And then with dramas, the fourth foundation, or the fourth frame of reference. He talks about seeing events in the mind as events, coming, going. And you begin to see that there's a pattern, so you can understand why they come, why they go. 
And then if they're unskillful, you can figure out how to use that understanding of cause and effect to make sure they don't come back again. And if they're skillful, you can use your understanding of cause and effect to make sure that they stay and they grow and they develop. So basically the third frame of reference deals with your mind when things have invaded and are remaining, especially the ones that have to do with unskillful states of mind. But in the fourth, it's as if they're at the door waiting to come in. Think of the image of the gatekeeper. You're being mindful. So when these things come up, you say, nope, you don't come in. I know you're there. You're present. But you don't have to invade the fortress. You don't have to remain in the fortress. You can stay outside. This is why the Buddha said that mindfulness is the dam that holds these streams of emotion in check. It's the restraint. It's as if they're offering themselves at the doorway. And you see that these states of mind are unskillful. You say, nope, you're here, but you can't come in. That's the difference between simply having the mind as it normally relates to its emotions and beginning to get a sense of mindfulness and then discernment. Because the mindfulness at best can hold these things in check to make sure you don't act on them, that they don't move in and take over. But they're still going to keep coming, coming, coming again, hopefully, hoping that the mindfulness will be absent or distracted so they can slip in. So it's discernment, though, that understands them, how they come, and how you can undercut them by figuring out what the causes are. And that's what you do in the present moment. The fact that they're coming to the door comes from the past karma you've committed, either in this lifetime or previous lifetimes. But your question is, are you going to let them in? And then you examine them. Why do they keep coming? Where are they coming from? It's when you hold them in check like this that you can examine them. If you let them in, they just take over. You don't really see them clearly because they seem to just flow naturally. It's only when you go against the flow that you know how strong the flow can be and where it is and what it's coming from. Here again, think of the image of the dam. You're going to build a dam across the river. You're going to learn an awful lot about the river by the time you're done. It's going to show where its really deep currents are. And then you can trace them back. Why are they so strong? What is their appeal? And when you act on them, what actually happens? What are the results? And how can you undercut the causes by figuring out why the allure is not worth it? So simply the fact that you can check an emotion and hold it back for a while and then it disappears. It doesn't mean you've gained insight into the emotion at all. It means you've been able to restrain it. Now, restraining it, however, it does put you in a position where you can study it. Because one of the first things it'll do, it'll, it'll complain. Why can't you let me act out on when I've acted out so many times before? It's amazing how our defilements have such a strong sense of entitlement on the one hand. But on the other hand, it's not all that amazing at all, because they have been able to move in and order you around. As our reflection said, we've been a slave to craving for who knows how long. You know what slave masters are like? The idea that the slaves would have a revolt, that slaves would want freedom. Slave masters don't want that. So your defilements will whine. And you want to listen to them carefully, how they whine, how they argue, what their reasons are. You 
history and all those tracts by slave owners back before the Civil War. And they had all kinds of reasons based on their religion, based on whatever, and saying that slavery was a good thing. That's like the defilements. They'll tell you that they're a good thing. And they enforce that idea with their power. But the Buddha is saying you don't have to submit. You can push back. And when you push back at them, then you begin to see how weak their cases are. So we want to practice restraint as we can, so that we can see these things. And then when we see them, figure them out. in line with the Four Noble Truths. Okay, where's the craving here? What is the craving based on? What feelings, what intentions, what acts of attention? When you want to look at the Bannock Horizon, the really interesting factors are the ones that come before sensory contact, name and form or fabrication. What perceptions fuel your greed, anger, and delusion? What intentions fuel it? What Ways of paying it, attention to things fuel these things. Look into those, because that's where you can make a difference here in the present moment. You may not be able to choose who's going to appear at your door, who wants to get into the fortress. But you do have the choice of saying no, and then tracing them back. Where do these enemies come from? Where do they get their food? So they keep coming back again and again and again. It's not that somebody else is feeding them. You've been feeding them. But why? How? That's what you want to figure out. And that's how you use this element of freedom that you have in the present moment to shape things. The Buddha's analysis is that we have the potential for the different aggregates coming from past actions. And then through our acts of fabrication, we turn them into actual experiences of the aggregates. And we do it for the sake of something. We do it for the sake of pleasure. We think we're going to get something out of it. So you want to look into that intentional element in everything that c comes up. And that's something you do in the present moment. What you're trying to do is change those intentions. For a long time, your intention has been to let whoever comes to the door into the fortress. But now you're changing your intention. You don't want these things to invade. You don't want them to remain. Build on that intention. Because that intention is what gives rise to discernment, and the discernment is what gives rise to freedom. And that happiness we want. So in spite of the aggregates being in constant stressful in that self, there is something else that lies beyond those characteristics, beyond those attributes. And that's where we really can be happy.